and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it is time once again for All Things Cleveland Cavaliers. This is episode number 68. Brandon Lewis, Joey Schneider here with you as always. And Joey, we have one more game. That's it. Until the All-Star break. Oh, baby. We are recording on Wednesday. It is 7, 12 in the evening. We are about about 18 minutes here from tip-off from the Cavs and the Phillies. I was about to say the Phillies. Uh, the Cavs, the Cavs, and the Sixers here. Um, both Philadelphia teams. Who cares? And it's you know it's 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 a big game. It's a big game, and we'll get into it here in a minute. But Brandon, you know, last week we had uh, we had a great guest on, and Jeff from the Cleveland Pulse, and we talked a lot a lot of topics. But at the end of the show, out like we normally do, we talked about the upcoming schedule. Me and uh, me and Justin, the Cavs are going to go four and zero, and right now they are sitting at three and zero on a seven game win streak. I think uh, I think it's time for a bit of a recap here, don't you? Yeah, I agree. Go ahead. So uh, on the tenth, the Cavs uh, went into went into uh, New Orleans, came out with a victory one eighteen one oh seven against the Pelicans. Cavs playing really, really good basketball. Man, does Jared Allen just look like an animal. Evan Mobley is just, he's getting there, man. I'm telling you. That, um, th- that was a game where the Cavs just got hot early. They stayed hot. The score does not indicate how much they dominated that game. I mean, they 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 let their foot off the gas in the fourth quarter because the game was over for mm-hmm. all intents and purposes. Uh, again, it was it was the same thing they did the prior week against Washington and Indiana, where they just came out immediately. They put their foot on the gas. They proved who the the better team was. And I think, and you were alluding to it, Jared Allen and Evan Mobley, both inside, dominating on the offensive and defensive ends of the court, really setting the tone of the line for, for great opportunities for the other guys in the court. Uh, you know, absolutely. You know, Dean Wade getting his legs back under him. Uh, I know he. I, I believe he is. He is um, a game time decision today. Ricky Rubio. Um, I believe he has an illness. So you know, next time that we have, a, you know, we do record ATC, we'll know whether or not he played. But Ricky Rubio getting his legs back under him, and he has been passing the ball absolutely phenomenal, shooting a three, just great. Um, but that was a that was a big win. That's a good team out in the West. Uh, they had Brandon Ingram back. They still didn't have Zion, but, um, you know, they had everyone except Zion, and the Cavs just really worked them the entire game, like you said. Never, you know, pretty much never let the gas off, till, gas off uh, until the fourth quarter when they, they knew the game was in hand. And, uh, God, you know, I will say this. That that game was a, was a nationally televised game. And uh, just like the game tonight, which is now nationally televised, it was supposed to be a 7 p.m. start, got moved to 7.30 because there is some importance on this game. And we, like I said, we will talk about it. But that was a nationally televised game. And if I had to hear any more about Trey Murphy, I was going to I was gonna break my TV. They didn't talk about how good – it seemed like they were not talking about how good the Cavs were playing, but how great the Pelicans were even though they were getting killed the entire game. That, and what's facing New Orleans, I mean, you mentioned it, right? They're still a good team, but since Zion's been out, obviously Ingram is back, but they have really fallen off a cliff uh, a little bit. Uh, They have had a rough January, early February. They're not as scary as what they were a month ago. Um, And and the West, as we talked about last week, is certainly uh, a dogfight, as is the top of, of, of the East. But yeah, I think that the Cavs really 
just I don't understand that perspective at all because from my perspective, the Cavs just came out. They were the better team from start to finish on Friday night. Exactly. Uh, the very next night at home, Cleveland, you know, I, I remember hearing Chicago, you know, they played Chicago the next night. The Bulls were in Cleveland before the, the Cavaliers even got back. It was a home game. Chicago in Cleveland, and Cleveland picked up the win 97 89, a low scoring affair. That defense was definitely there. Another game that the Cavs pretty much had in hand from start to finish. Got a little dicey, I think. Was that the uh, game? Was, or... No, they, they that, that was a Spurs game. They were trailing most of that game against Chicago. That's right. Um, they, they, I believe they took the lead in the third quarter, right? Yeah, wait, wait, third. Yeah, okay, okay. Going into the fourth. Um, and I know, you know, the built in excuse is already there about the back to back and the Cavs were tired, etc. I don't really care. Um, the Cavs are flat out better. Then the Bulls, the Bulls are not a, a, a very good basketball team. Uh, you could tell that the Cavs were, were tired, uh, which I think part of it is because of the fact that we still don't have a lot of contributions off the bench and we're still playing guys in a, in a blowout yeah. against New Orleans, you know, midway through the fourth quarter, which shouldn't be happening. Uh, so that would have been on the coaching side from my perspective. Regardless, though, um, they got the win. Which they absolutely sure they 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 played well in in the fourth quarter, but it it wasn't really a statement win. You know, it wasn't really a, a oh my god panic loss. It was more of like yeah, the game happened. They won. Move on to San Antonio type game. So for me, for me, you know, I'm sorry, I, I had my notes crossed on this one. Um, they, it's that they couldn't get the lid off the rim until the second half, and they but. This win to me was, I think, a little bit more important than it was to you. And because to me, it, this is one of those games where the Cavs earlier in the season, when we kept saying they got, you know, they have to learn to win. This is one of those games where they were tired, they were down, they came back, they took the lead, and then they never gave the lead back. Even though the Bulls kept charging, the Cavs wouldn't relinquish it. And this that's the type of win the Cavs needed. Your dog tired. You're down. No one's gonna fault you for losing this game if it's you know if it's close. And they were like, we're not even going to lose this game. They came back. They got the lead. They didn't let go of the lead even when the Bulls put on, uh, you know, really stepped on the gas. And they came out with a win. To me, that is a sign of a team that is growing. And it was a good. It was a really good win in my book. Um, it's, it's a good point. The biggest appreciation I had of the whole night is the Cavs actually played their guys and nobody load won't manage on a back to back, which yeah. is a rarity in in today's game. And the Cavs have seen the courts all season long. Yeah, then uh the San Antonio Spurs came into Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse and the Cavs that was a that was a good game. 117, 109 was a final. The Cavs got the victory, but the Spurs, you know, the Cavs tend to struggle with them, those young teams that just have, you know, nothing to lose, a lot to prove. And Donovan took a 40 point uh, outing from Donovan Mitchell to get it done. Um, you know, some players had some some off games, but again, you know, there was a game they should have won. They they did win. I think it was start to finish. They pretty much had, you know, start to finish, they had the game in hand. Yeah, I mean, um, it was a little bit dicey towards towards the end, but as you mentioned, the Cavs w- w- were able to pull away. Um, this might be my hot take today of the podcast, but it's about the opponent, the Spurs, and it's the – I really, I'll be honest, I have no respect for the Spurs at all. Uh, you, don't, I don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't respect I, Popovich? I don't. I, oh, I think man. Popovich is out of touch. Uh, I I don't think he understands modern NBA basketball. I think the Spurs have been bad for five to ten years ever, ever since Tim Tim Duncan retired. Um, I don't I know t- why. I, I mean, they know. they won a championship with the. I, I would say I would say they they haven't been good since since Kawhi left. Okay, that's fair. But I mean, they they have not been good in years. Uh, Greg Popovich feels like a stubborn old man who was sticking to his old school ways. To me, uh, I barely don't even know why he's still in the NBA. I'll be honest with you. I feel like it's it's a young man's league. Uh, I think the Spurs are a really good basketball team, and outside of if they get a top 
you know, for repick and they really did on it. I don't see any direction for this franchise. Uh, they tried to make DeMar DeRozan work with the Kawhi Leonard trade, did not happen. They they bet at the at the bottom of the barrel. And for me, as you mentioned, as soon as Kawhi Leonard left, there has been no no mystique, if you will, among the once great almighty San Antonio Spurs. And so I wanted the Cavs to completely wipe the Spurs off the floor. Um, it happened for about two quarters, then they let the Spurs come back, then the Cavs were able to take care of business. But again, from my perspective of the game, they just took care of business and are getting ready for this game tonight against Philly. What happens if the Spurs get Wembyama? Now that's a game changer. But <laughs> but here but the, again, it's like Popovich has been in the league now. They I I think they said he's been in the league for 27 years, um, which is older than I've been alive. Um, so you're, you're a young buck. <laughs> my, I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering, man, you know, we've seen the, the evolution of sports and in the NBA in particular over the last 10 years. And it feels like some of these old school minded, you know, tough, you know, ingrained defensive franchises. Some points this year, I guess, kind of felt like the Cavs have been that way, where, where it's been all about defense. They're not scoring, and it's up and minus and playing all these guys. Uh, Thibodeau re- reminds me a, a lot of that um, it, with, with, with the Knicks as well. And to me, there's just there's a ceiling on it. Um, I don't like it. I don't. I don't think it's in, it's embracing the new game. And to me, uh, the cream rises to to the crop, and the Cavs took care of a, a really bad basketball team, in my opinion, Monday night. I agree with you 100, percent except on the entire Popovich uh, thing. I love I love Pop. I think that he's a great coach. I think that when he gets um when he gets some players that he can. Really coach up someone, you know, someone like on that team like Keldon Johnson. Keldon Johnson on any other team is probably a six man. And on the Spurs, he is, I mean, he's young. He's a true small forward. And, you know, he's averaging 20 plus points a game. I mean, he could, he could do everything. And a lot of that is, is coaching and is, is, is Popovich. You know, he did the same thing with Kawhi. You know, he, you know, he, Duncan, you know, I think he had Robinson there for, yeah. Ellie, you know, a little it was bit. Duncan and Robinson, the 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 twin towers, won Parker, that championship in '99. Yeah. Tony Parker, of course, the 2007 uh, NBA Finals MVP. Mono Ginobili. Um, Mono. So yeah, I mean, well, he, I mean, the, he the saw, Spurs had their day, but again, they, it, they did. But like you know, I mean, how good are some of those players on lesser on a team with lesser coaches? I think they're still as good. That I, that's I just don't. me. I don't. I th- I, th- I think Popovich is a great coach, and I think that he will get there again when he gets some players that want to learn from one of the best. Okay, that's fair. But we will we will agree to disagree on that when we're very few. Um, yeah, I, worry, I really want to talk about this Philly game. Um, but I we got to talk about something here in, in, in the meantime. <sighs> I'm gonna try not to be long winded on this one. I am really liking what I'm seeing from Evan Mobley and from Isaac Okoro. We've talked about this almost every podcast for, I want to say the last four podcasts. Now it seems like Mobley starting to find his groove, starting to get a little bit more comfortable. You could still see where he's a little apprehensive when it comes to some shots that maybe he should take. Even if, you know, even if he misses, take the shot, you know, you're, you're wide open. We, you know, you know, you can hit it. You know, I think that the, the team's trying to like let him know, like, take the shot, man. Like, you know, okay, if you miss it, it's just one possession. And Okoro, you know, he's a guy, he's he's only 22. We 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 you know, over the past you know, year and a half since we've been going 68 episodes, we've had good things to say. We've absolutely tore into him as well. And it's come out of a place of understanding that. He's just he wasn't reaching his potential, and now seeing him where he's at when he fires up a three, I actually expect it to go in. You know, the last time I remember we said, not I said not many episodes ago. Yeah, earlier, don't, don't take a three. Earlier in the year, never take a three in in, in a winning in winning time, and now you know, I'm, if he's uh, if he's open, take it because I because I have the, I have faith that that ball is going in. And his defense has gotten even better. I mean, you know, we have the number one defense in the league. So I'm just, I'm really happy with those guys. Really happy with the Cavs team. And the Cavs have made an addition. Yes, they have. Without 
making a trade, the Cavs yep. have brought back Danny Green, who is most known for his dancing abilities with LeBron and not playing. He then went around the NBA to a bunch of teams. He is an NBA champion. He is a true three and D wing. He's a little up there in age now, but he is still going to be able to get the job done. I think. So, from my perspective on this move, uh, I think that this is a a great example of a really no risk potential high reward type move from from the Cavs. This is what good teams do. This is what playoff teams do. We see it every year at the trade deadline where teams who are unable to make a move at the deadline look to the buyout market and try to make an addition. Uh, I think that this goes one or two ways, and I don't think that there's really any in between. I think that there's a way where Danny Green either comes off the bench or if there's an injury, he can still start. And I think he really does provide a great spark, a true, as Joey just mentioned, a true free and deep type player. Um, and a true veteran leader who, again, is a two-time NBA champion, once with the almighty Greg Popovich and the San Antonio Spurs in uh, 2014, and then once with the Lakers in the bubble in 2020. Um, but I also think, you know, there there is another part where maybe it's just, maybe, maybe Danny doesn't have it anymore. Maybe he's over the hill. Maybe he is washed. Uh, and he's not the Danny Green that we all think he can be uh, and he just doesn't produce which is okay because then he can just sit on the bench and be a cheerleader next to Kevin Love and uh, Robin Lopez so you know it's it's no hurt no foul I think him coming off the bench and being that guy you know almost in the role that a Coro is in the starting lineup where he just sort of stands there and then and and the corner three and Rubio and kind of deliver him the ball and he can knock down shots uh, and give again that bench uh so much needed production because I think it was midway through the I can't recall if it was the Chicago game or the San Antonio game. I believe it was the Chicago the Chicago game. It was a Chicago game. But at one point in that game, Jetty Osmond was the only person scoring and he had like four mm-hmm. points and that was the only bench production. I mean you um, I think we only had I think four four yeah. total bench points in yeah. the entire game. Yeah and, and it, it was, was all Jetty. And so, it just, just they just couldn't I mean they everyone was missing threes from starting lineup to uh to the bench no one was able to hit those threes and that's you know the the big men won us that game that night yeah they they did again uh and you know it's it's a little bit scary uh because again if if Danny cannot help you off the bench I think the Cavs and we talked about this with Jeff last week we both agree now the Cavs are without a doubt a top four potentially top three seed in the Eastern Conference come spring come playoff time but I know in the NBA playoffs, right, it's it's all about the stars. It's all about the, 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 the talent you have. But even the great championship teams have depth. And, you know, if the Cavs have to continuously play their guys, we've talked about this, 38, 39, 40 minutes a game, that's not going to equate to winning time in the postseason. Yeah, I agree with you. I do. I, I don't see any scenario where Danny Green is starting at all. I think that you know, unless Jetty and Okoro and Lavert are all hurt, okay. uh, he is just a hundred percent a bench player. But I think you know, I don't need him to score fifteen points. I don't even need. I don't even need him to be a Lavert. If he can give me two threes in eight to yeah. ten minutes off the no, bench, I agree. that's that's what I'm looking for. You know, just a little bit of extra firepower, and that, that's why they, uh, you know, like you said, it was it's it's a very it's a absolutely no risk and I a, you know a decently high reward. You know, situation. They he needs, like you said, he needs about six to eight points. I could even make a case. You need like six to eight minutes. That period where where Garland and Mitchell can just, and again, maybe it's just in between quarters to give them that little bit of an extra rest. You know, between the third and the fourth, mm-hmm. and, and between the first and the second or second and a half time, however you want to do it. That period where, and we've talked about this really all year. They just need that little bit of a stretch to where your two main primary ball handlers are not on the court and you don't get behind when they're on the court. Because what do we have seen from Cavs teams, whether it was the finals days with LeBron or whether it was recent with these Cavs teams, it always seems to be a problem with the Cavs is when they have great players and when they have great talent that when they leave the court, uh, the Cavs bench is just not 
up up to par, and then you're forcing your Donovan Mitchells, your Darius Garlands to play, you know, up to 40 North minutes in games that really the Cavs have had the upper end, and they shouldn't be playing more than 30 to 35 minutes a night. Yeah, I mean, I agree 100%. And hopefully that'll alleviate some of that. We'll see moving forward. Uh, I believe tonight is his first night suiting up, and we are going to talk tonight about the Philadelphia 76ers. Game is about to start here, but we're going to talk about it. Um, the game was moved, like I said earlier in the show, from 7 to 7.30 because it is now nationally televised. It is a big game in my mind, and I know this was this was asked on a on another show um, earlier, um, you know, whether you thought this game – they were asking everyone if they thought this was a big game. You know, is it just another game in, in the season or, you know, is it a big game in your mind? For me, it's a big game because how many times last year did we need to beat Philadelphia and we couldn't and it would have vaulted us over them. And here we are, you know, deja vu all over again. Last game before the All-Star break where, you know, everyone's going to get a rest. Can we get this big victory to tie us with Philadelphia for third place in the East? That's a huge momentum swing. Especially after the All Star break, I this game they need to be high energy. They need to be. They need to figure out what they're going to do with Embiid. Although I know Embiid is questionable, so I'm still not sure if he's playing. I believe he is, though. Uh, I might be wrong. Well, we'll find out. But this is a game that they don't need to win, but a game that go will go a long way for me. If they do, in fact, win. If they win this game, I can say I have faith that this team can can hang with anybody, that they can get over the hump now, not just get right up to it like last year, that they can get over the hump, that they can, you know, flight for that third, that third seed, which is a lot more coveted now than it was uh, before the trade deadline. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a big game. Okay, so before I comment on this game, I have to get this out of the way. Um, Because the Cavs are playing Philadelphia tonight, and the city of Philadelphia is still grieving over what happened (laughs) Sunday night uh, in the desert in Arizona. So I had to get that out of the way first. Let me let me say my condolences to you, Brandon. Brandon, obviously, if you have listened to ATC, Brandon is a Philadelphia Eagles fan, and I was I was right there with you, man. I was cheering on the Eagles. I wanted to see the Eagles win. Um, I do, you know, you know, I am a big fan of the Kelsey brothers, um, but Jason is one of my favorite players in the league. Um, so to see him. Uh, not not get that second ring hurt. To see Travis get his second, I was happy. But I, you know, man, I really wanted, I really, I really wanted Philly to get that win, and uh, I was not happy with that final call. And I don't care what anyone says. This is a bad. You know, obviously, this is a this is a cab show, but I'm I'm gonna say this real quick about football. If you're gonna call that, if that's gonna be a penalty. That that defensive holding, that happens almost every single freaking play, <laughs> and you're gonna call it in the most clutch moment of the game to me is ridiculous. I don't want to hear anyone else's thoughts on it. This is not an open-ended conversation. This is just me and my thoughts. And I think that, you know, congratulations to the chiefs, except Juju Smith Schuster, because I cannot stand you. And, um, you know, congratulations to the Eagles. You guys played a heck of a game. One of the best, one of the best games I've seen in a long time to the you know, the, the rest took it out of the, out of the hands of the players and uh, I'm sure we will be seeing both teams there again in the, uh, the not too distant future. Hopefully the Browns can somehow find a way, <laughs> but I'm not getting my hopes up. Joey, I'm glad you brought that up because my prediction tonight is is, is, is the Cavs are going to get a, a benefit of a call at the free throw line at the end of the game. <laughs> They're going to win by one in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia is going to go back crazy because they got screwed over by the refs again. <laughs> Okay, no, seriously. The script is in. Yeah, Uh, uh, about this game. So I thought a lot about this, and I understand to a certain extent, and I agree to a certain extent of what you said. However, for me, this game is not as important to me because of a little bit of what you said is 
I believe at this point now, with Miami not being as good as everybody thought that they were going to be this year, uh, Brooklyn is now completely out of, of the way. Uh, and the Cavs, for the most part, have gotten through the gauntlet of their schedule. They they have, you know, a, a, not an easy, but a relatively not as difficult task as, as what they had last year when it was a complete gauntlet of the schedule to end the season. And the Cavs have made additions this year, such as Donovan Mitchell. Because of those reasons, I believe sitting here right now today as these standings that there is no way, I'm going on record right now, there is no way in hell, win or lose this game tonight, the Cavs do not finish as a top four seed in the Eastern Conference. They are going to be somewhere in that top four. So it depends on what matchup you want in the first round. You're probably going to get Miami. So in the second round, obviously, with Milwaukee and Boston very tight up, in that Eastern Conference, you know, who would you rather play essentially? And we'll get to that, see that more down the line between Boston and Milwaukee in a second round series. But for me, this is more of can the Cavs play well? Um, you know, if they get blown out again. I think there, there are some concerns. But even if they do, there is a good chance. I know they have Denver and Atlanta right after the All Star break. But it is also the NBA regular season. We have seen the regular season in the, in the NBA almost not matter as much in home court advantage, not matter as much in recent years as we talked about as much as team team chemistry and just good overall basketball team is concerned. So it's more of me being more confident that win or lose, this isn't going to affect the Cavs long season term. And that's why for me, you know, if, if this was, you know, late April and you got a game or two between you and the Sixers for for the seed, could you look back at it and say, oh, yeah, this was the deciding factor? Sure. But unless, you know, you're playing the last game of the year and you're a game back and this is for that seed, I don't think it's it's that big of a deal. I understand why ESPN plucks the game because obviously Brooklyn has no real, you know, superstar attraction now outside of Ben Simmons. Uh, and Miami hasn't been as good, which is why I think the Cavs and Sixers got plucked into that spot. But I don't think it's necessarily, uh, hey, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, Panic, it's the wall type of situation that the Cavs lose this game because I think the East now is more open than what it was at the beginning of the season. I so the Cavs have one of the easiest schedules, remaining schedules after the all-star break. Mm -hmm. But this, but like I said, this game to me is just we lost four times, I think. Was it four? I believe we lost four I believe times. Believe it was four because we last, played three this year. So we yeah. lost four times to the Sixers last year. I think three of them were games where if we would have beaten them, we would have vaulted them in the standings, and we never did. And and two of them we could have won easily. Right. So the so for me, the game has meaning because it's a chance to vault the Sixers which we could not do last year. We could not get ahead of them. And if we can do that this year, it shows me that we are a team. We are a different team this year than we were last year. We obviously know this already, but when you're going up against another team that is a contender and you can vault them in the standings, that puts you in a better place, obviously. And I think that a win tonight just is going to be that much more of a, a, a propelling the team forward through the all-star break and giving them that much confidence when they come back. But speaking of the all-star game, we got to give a huge shout out one more time to one of the, the, the East's starting shooting guard, Donovan Mitchell. This is his fourth all-star game. First time starting 100% deserves it. Um, you know, when we, well, we found out that we got Donovan Mitchell. We went absolutely nuts, had a huge celebratory show, and um, I almost missed it. I think it was like the week before I, I left on for vacation. I think it was the week <clears throat> you came back. No, it was, yeah. it, it was the week you came back, I think. Mm. Yeah, it was one of the two. I know like I wasn't 100% sure if I was going to be able to do the show or not, and luckily I was. Yeah. I mean, it was um, it was the day we were recording, so you know, um, seeing 
Donovan on the Cavs. It's almost it almost feels like he's always been on the Cavs. I like know he's, he's done such a great job of 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 being a you know a great teammate, but also getting to know the city very well, very quickly. And being a you know just being a great uh, a great addition that, to, to, just, the, to the and team, just being the guy. I mm-hmm. mean, the the Cavs have a great part. And we talk about obviously how how great Darius Garland is and Jared Allen and Evan Mobley, but Mitchell from game one this year made it clear if you were to rank the Cavs top four players, Mitchell is in my opinion, and I think yours well number one right now on the team. I mean, like they, he, they they're a different team without Mitchell. I think I mean I think Donovan Mitchell's a top ten player in the league. You could make that that argument. That's hard for me to confirm or or deny that right now, just because I would have to literally go through it in my head and think um about all the players. But I think you could legitimately I could sit I here and that. say right now, top three in the East, legitimately, I would say. Um, obviously Giannis and Bede, and I think you're making an argument between him and Tatum. And I, right now, I would take Mitchell over Tatum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Mitchell's a little more, um, a little more consistent. Even on yep. his, even even on his off nights, he's still, you know, 23, 25 which, points. Which, which again, for me, this is, and I and I said this over and over. This goes back to my point about tonight's game. We now both fully expect the Cavs to at least be in that top four range top in four, the East. Yeah. So this is why for me, and I and I hate to say this, but I am going to admit this. For me, the rest of this regular season, for me, it's like, yes, go ahead, win games, lose games. I just want to see this team get to the postseason. This regular season now, if there's two months left. It just feels like a drag for me because the real test for this team, I believe, will be in the postseason. How do these guys play in a seven-game series when you see the same team for two weeks in a row? How do the coaches adjust? And how do our biggest stars on the biggest stage perform? Because that is going to be the true test to see where this team really is. Well, and I think that that's where, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's something Donovan Mitchell brings because he's been there and, and he did yep. it in the West with the, with the, absolutely with the jazz. But I, you know, there, I want to see that, you know, if the Cavs have this, they have an easier schedule coming up after the break. You know, they do see Boston again, you know, they see some, they do see some good teams, but for the most part, you know, they're, you're talking, you know, Washington a couple of times, Charlotte, um, you know, just some really bad teams, you know, Detroit, you know, we're and, gonna see some and they, the they will be tanking even more, by the way, come oh, that yeah. time. You, you know, um so, so the, there are the wins that we need that we need to have, but the Cavs have a really good sh- a chance of getting a really high spot, not just you know, yeah. four, but maybe three, maybe even two if they, you know Boston they, they have a real or, chance or Milwaukee drops some day. Yeah, drop some games. I mean Milwaukee hasn't hasn't been healthy really this whole year. Uh mm-hmm. Boston now we know Jalen Brown's out. Um, you know, they've been good all year, but you know, they they made the finals last year. How much was that? Because of course Middleton's injury, we really have no idea. Um, and then Philly, like I'll, I'll this is why I don't fear Philly that much because I get it. It's a the Cavs have not beat Philly, but Philly in the postseason, as much as I love Joel Embiid, they have done nothing in the playoffs. Uh, they have proven nothing now. The Cavs haven't proven anything either, but the Cavs haven't been there. Philly has been there and they have proven nothing. Uh, and Doc Rivers is, I call him. Basically, the Andy Reid of, of, of the NBA, where for years, obviously, before Reid got Mahomes, he would make the postseason and choke every single year. That's what that's what Doc Rivers reminds me of. You know, Doc had that one championship in Boston, and ever since, is a great team. Uh, the 2014 Clippers team, you know, the Philly team that lost to Toronto, Philly team the next year that lost to that Trey Young Atlanta team. So, like, there is history there with the Sixers. Until they do anything, I don't believe them to be a legit contender. Um, And, again, we'll see what the Cavs do come this spring. Real quick note, Embiid is playing tonight. So, that will be – it's going to be a good game. Brandon, uh, you know, all-star break. I I don't – I don't know. I I think we'll have a show next week just kind of detailing the the back end of the – of the schedule, we'll hey, you know, we'll, 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 getting, we'll, we'll, we'll getting ready we'll, for we'll the back up and you know we'll, we'll, we'll come with something to talk about. We always do talking about uh, <clears throat> the disaster 
that will probably be NBA All Star Weekend. Uh, <laughs> I I think that that's where you are you are about to get at. Uh, I, and I have I, said I, this, uh... you know, I I said this last year. Um, and and everybody in ATC knows this by now. I don't give a bleep about All Star Weekend. I I really don't. Evan Mobley's in the skills competition. Great. Don't do it, Evan Mobley. As long as you don't get hurt, have fun. Uh, he, I don't he, care if you win. Not, not the skill, not the skills. The uh, the rising stars. Oh, the 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 rising stars. My my bad on that. My apologies on that. <laughs> Again, just 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 like Joey made a minor error at the beginning of the show. It's my turn to make it even bigger error now. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, Mobley, go great. Have fun at it. Um, you know, as as, as long as you get hurt. Um, that's don't, all I care about. As long as you don't get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Donovan Mitchell declined the free point invitation, which I'm totally okay with. Um, you, you know, I wouldn't even care if he decided to not play in the game. Well, he uh, is. As, he's as, definitely which, playing. Which he is. But again, as long as these guys don't get hurt, we're okay with it. Uh, the dunk gun dust, you know, it's pretty much. Oh my great. God. Is it so bad? It's, I, it's a, there's like two players who I had to look up who they I were. I know. I'm like, it's guys you don't even know. Three point gun does have some good names, but it does. And I it mean, did and, and it did last year. You know, here here's my thing real quick, Brandon, on the All Star Weekend. I used to look forward to it. Now I actually I don't care. I do enjoy watching the actual game because it's really just the players putting on a show for the crowd. You know, no one plays defense. Everyone's just dunking all over. You know, last year was last year's game was extremely fun. Steph yeah. Curry just bombing through some all over, you know, and um it, you know, I thought the game, the, the All Star game itself is just a, it's, it's just, it's entertaining. But everything else, the skills challenge, the three point, the dunk contest, especially dunk contest. Now, you can't get a good, a, a big name in there if you offered them, um, you know, and they, I think they have offered guys a million, million dollars and they, and they decline. Yeah, I guarantee it. The, the arena sold out and tickets are, are selling and food's going to be, you know, all that merchandise and contest and all that. Like people, some people just eat it up and, you know, I said the same thing about it's almost the same thing as like preseason, right? Where where it's like you know, no one really cares about it, but people still go and pay their money and give all this and buy tickets. Well, pre and, you preseason know, it's revenue for the week, so right. But preseason is different because you still get to see some of you know some of the the better players play for without what, having a quarter, maybe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but yeah, but without having to pay full price for a ticket. Sometimes they're still full price. I don't, I'm not not during preseason. You, you can go to. I, I've had people offer me preseason like I, like preseason for like five bucks. Yeah, because they're giving them away. Right, but like you, but a game during the season, you know, here you want to go to the game. Sure, how much per ticket? Uh, two fifty. Where are yeah, they? Really? Your backs. Es your especially, backs. Especially your now, backs against the wall. Especially the now, top. it's spider. Yeah. Oh. But Brandon. Everyone knows our disdain for the All Star Weekend. Hopefully, the Cavs can pull out the win the night against Philadelphia and be tied for the third seed going into the All Star break. We'll be back next week talking all things Cavs, baby. The, the the first game back, I believe, is against the Denver Nuggets, and they have a MVP type candidate in Nikola Jokic, obviously, who I still cannot figure out how the dude puts up 30 points a game and cannot jump one millimeter off the floor. Uh, it, it baffles me. It rattles me. Uh, and and I, we will get a chance to see it first hand next Thursday night. And I cannot wait. Brandon, good show. Always a pleasure. And there's only one thing left to do. That is to let him go. Thank you.